Well, thank you for your service. And, yeah. So, grateful to live in America in such a time as this. All right, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Genesis, chapter 13. Genesis, the 13th chapter. While you're finding that, I just want to uh, let you know that we're continuing our series here called Friends for Life, where we've been doing a little research into relationships. Uh, you know, I'm going camping tomorrow, and uh, I was going to go to Yellowstone, but they got a foot of snow up there, and so I, I, my, my reservations were canceled because of the global pandemic. This is the only time I've been grateful for the global pandemic. <laughs> That's, I missed out on a foot of snow, and I wouldn't have probably gone anyway, so... Uh, you know, I, I was talking to my brother-in-law. He said he was at the RV store getting some uh, stuff ready for the camping trip. And, you know, he said that when he went in there, he heard the manager who was arguing with uh, either a customer or an employee. And he looked at the lady at the front desk and he said, uh, boy, things are tough around here. She said, it's been a tough week. She said, people are on edge. I mean, that's what it seems like. I read in the news that tensions are high in America. And I just couldn't think of a better time to minister on the subject of relational health than the hour that we're currently living in right now. Uh, I want to read from the text in Genesis 13. I'm going to start in verse 5, read down a few verses, and then we'll pray. This is the story of Lot and Abraham. It says in verse 5 that Lot went with Abram in flocks and herds and tents. It says the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. It says that there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites dwelt in the land. And it says, Abraham said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we're brethren. It's not the whole land before you. And he said, Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. If you go to the right, then I will go to the left. Let's pray. Father, this morning we just thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness and that you watch out over your people. And I'm praying, Lord, for healthy hearts, receptive to receive the word of God that I pray would multiply and grow in people's spirits and produce fruit in their lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. So a couple years ago, actually more like a decade ago, when I first discovered Facebook and got onto it, I came across what I thought was a rather hilarious meme. Um, now, it, you know what a meme is? It's a picture, right? You share it. And in full disclosure... I am a bit of a clown, especially when it comes to sports. And the meme had uh, a woman whispering in a guy's ear. They were like cartoon figures. And it said that my girlfriend asked me to some whisper something sexy in her ear. And so I said, go Packers. <laughs> now, I posted that on my friend's timeline because, you know, he was a Seahawks fan and his girlfriend at the time was a Packers fan. But, you know, she was offended by it. She said it was inappropriate for me as a pastor to share those things on Facebook in public like that. And uh, since that time, I'm sorry to say, I've had many Facebook faux pas, if you will. I'm really working on it. But, you know, like Facebook can be the tool of the devil. Unless you're watching on Facebook, then we said hi. Like, keep on. <laughs> but, you know, we have a society today that's offended at everything. Isn't that right? I mean, they're constantly offended by little things and, small, and seemingly insignificant things and, like, you can't even talk politics to people today. Like, they get so mad about it. Uh, you know, we got people mad on social media if, if they got likes or if they don't have likes. And, and they get mad if you, you know, comment or you don't comment. And now we got people mad about, you know, the pandemic taking place. If you have church service, they get mad at you. If you're not having church service, people get offended at you. And, uh, you know, if you go somewhere with a mask, people look at you funny. If you don't have one, I mean, it's just like, there's all kinds of reasons right now in culture to get offended. And so what you need to know this morning is how to get past an offense, how to move forward with your life. I'm going to teach you how to go on down to Lowe's, get yourself a ladder, and get over it. That's what we're going to teach you this morning. So uh, I want to start in chapter 13 here of Genesis in verse number one. Uh, it says that Abram went from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and it says Lot went with him. To the south. I think this is the reason Lot went with him. In verse 2, it says he was, Abraham was very rich, not just rich, very rich in livestock and silver and gold. I, I think Lot knew that Abraham was well to do. I think that's one of his motivating factors. He noticed it, in my opinion. 
And so it tells us that in verse 5 that Lot is going with Abram with Lot's flocks and herds and tents. And we read the story here. The land was not able to support them. You know, I've been to that region of the world. Not a lot of grass over there. It says that uh, the land could not support them for their possessions were so great they could not dwell together. And so it says there was strife. Everybody say strife. There was strife between Abraham's cowboys and between Lot's cowhands. There was a problem right there. Uh, here, here's what I can give you the point, this, the first thing I want to highlight, that uh, offenses and strifes will, what we could say, complicate your relationships. I mean, if there's any kind of tension, turmoil, problem, you know, that's what strife is. It's, it's, a, it's a passionate response and a, a frustration that you have, a, a, a disagreement that's boiling up within you. And if you've ever been in a relational conflict like this, what you know is that strife has this ability to just wear you out emotionally. Have you noticed that, that strife does that? I mean, it zaps your strength, it zaps your energy. When you get offended at something, it's like you can spend all your time thinking about it to the point where it wears you out. So if you could ever identify in your life where the strife came from and learn to eliminate the offenses in your life, you could walk in a greater sense of, of God's peace for your life. So sometimes the first thing you got to do is just identify, you know, where does, where does the strife come from? What's the source of the offense? Why is it driving you nuts so much? Yeah, you know, I think strife, first of all, comes from possessions. Did, didn't we just read that in verse number six? They had possessions. Strife comes from having possessions in life sometimes. Nothing wrong with possessions and the blessing of God and, and, and all that he can do in your life, but sometimes it seems like the possessions you have comes between you and somebody else. Sometimes it just feels like those possessions are what people get their eyes on. You know, I know people who are offended at whoever they perceive to be a rich person. I've had people tell me that. I hate rich people. And it's, it's just kind of a, the, ingrained in their mindset. If they see something that someone has, you know, they get angry about it. And really what it is is, is probably a, a sense of competition and jealousy more than anything. But it creates strife. You know, in my home, we've learned how to get through strife because we've got a four-year-old girl and a two-year-old girl. And so now we just buy them the same Minnie Mouse doll for Christmas. If we get them the same thing, there's no problems. Everyone's got... The same possessions, we don't have to worry about it. But it's amazing how, you know, strife comes from possessions. Sometimes strife will also come from position. I mean, think about when King Saul noticed that David killed Goliath and the crowds were after him. It says that he eyed him from that day forward. King Saul grew increasingly insecure of his position and was threatened that David would come after it one day. You know, the thing about when God gives influence to somebody, it's God's to give. And if God doesn't give a person influence, it will never last. God is the one who ultimately puts people in places. He sets one down. He raises another up. That's how God does it. So you can't be jealous of someone's seeming position of influence that they might have. Uh, another place where strife really comes from, and offenses in particular, is when you have a wrong or unrealistic expectations from people. And I've seen this play out over and over where sometimes you've got an expectation or you've got you know, something that you thought would go one way and then it didn't go that way. I mean, what did Lot expect? Abraham's the guy whose idea it was to leave his home and go to a different place. Abraham's the wealthy guy and it seems that Lot is frustrated and jealous of what Abraham has. Seems like he's, he's troubled by that. But this happens to people when they have, you know, uh, wrong expectations. Like they get upset at a job because, you know, someone else got promoted or a pay raise they thought was warranted to them. Or, you know, maybe you have a, a family member that left an inheritance somewhere else or they gave someone else a gift. And the problem people get into is when they make assumptions about something that should, in their mind, belong to them. And so they have these unrealistic expectations, and a lot of times it creates strife or an offense in somebody. Yeah, another place where strife or offenses come is from the words that we speak. I mean, you know, when, when there's a heated argument, I mean, the, the cowboys and the cowpokes with Lot and Abraham, they were having problems. Like, there obviously was a heated exchange. 
You know, the Bible says in the book of James that the tongue is like a world of fire. And it has the power to be destructive. It, you've all been in those moments and arguments when you're talking with somebody and you can feel the heat being turned up, like that thing's about to escalate. And if you continue in the war of words, it's going to have tremendous and ill-intended consequences for your life. Yeah, Strife will do that. The words, the expectations you have. But you know, the opposite of strife is when there's unity involved. And Abraham knew enough about God and enough about believing God that he did not want to have any kind of strife get in his way. He did not have the time and the emotional energy to put into it. And, and so he and Lot are going to make a plan to separate from each other. What I want to show you this morning is how you can overcome uh, offense in relationships, how you can overcome this offense that you might sometimes get set in. You know, we said last week Abraham was blessed in all things. He was blessed with great relationships. I think one of the reasons why Abraham understood how to have good relationships. It's because of this incident that he went through with his nephew Lot. I mean, he kind of walked through it, and, you know, the man did live to be 120 years old. You get down the road that far, you will have a little wisdom in your life on how to handle people. And so here, here's Abraham. Let, let's read about this in, in verse number 8. It says that Abraham said to his impulsive, hot-headed nephew Lot, he said, dude, chill out, man. See, but notice how, you know, respectful he is. He said, please, please don't let there be strife between your boys and my boys. Look, we said, because we're family. We're brethren. And he said, isn't the whole land before you? And he does something rather amazing. He gives him the first choice of where to go. Separate from me, and if you want to go to the left, I'll go to the right, or vice versa. What, what this shows me in Abraham's dealing with Lot is, is one of the first ways you can overcome an offense. And that is that you're going to have to, first of all, be secure in who you are. You just got to chill out and relax. Be, be calm about it. You know, Abraham was not threatened by Lot. That's what security means. It means you're not threatened. It means that you don't perceive there to be any danger in the situation. And I just want to remind you that when you are secure in who God has called you to be, you don't have to be threatened by anybody. God's not giving you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a sound mind. You notice the love of God is what helps give you a sound mind. John says that fear is a tormenting thing. And so when people feel threatened, when they feel insecure, when, when, when they're off their game a little bit, a lot of times it's a reflection of the fact that they don't feel loved, they feel frustrated, they're afraid that something's going to happen. So if, if you want to, first of all, deal with people relationally, you're going to have to just be secure in who you are. See, Abraham believed God. He believed the promises that God had given him. God said, I'm going to make of you a great nation. God said, I'm going to bring you into the land. And Abraham believed those promises so much, he was resting in the promises of God. It caused him to calm down, relax. He said, I'm the one that has the promise. I'm the one that God spoke to and gave direction to. And so however Lot makes a decision, I know ultimately God is able to work all things out for good. Abraham had confidence in God's plan for his life, the plan of God that God has. I mean, he knew that whatever would take place, God would orchestrate it. Uh, it takes a certain level of security to walk in the plan of God for your life. What I think is amazing is that Abraham is willing to let Lot go. He just simply said, you know, you can take the first choice right here. He knew God was leading him. And what I found out is that if you, whatever you let go of, God can give it back to you because he's ultimately the one who is planning the footsteps in your life. He's orchestrating your steps. And sometimes just that simple act of letting something go will bring everything back in your life according to God's plan if it's supposed to be there. We can also see that Abraham was just happy with who he was. He, he was secure in the fact that God had called him to do something. You know, if, if people have a problem with you, then people have a problem. Because, you know, there's some things about you you can't change unless you get plastic surgery. But by and large, you know, the, the stuff that you have biologically, genetically, the personality you have, there's certain things that you just can't change about yourself. It's the way that God made you. You know, I, I always think about the time when I had a, a great friend of mine, a mentor, came to church one time, and he was commenting on what a sweet wife I have. 
And he said, if you have a problem with Elizabeth, you have a problem. <laughs> I found that to be true because Elizabeth is wonderful and sweet to me. And so if arguments come in the home, it's usually my problem. Can I get a witness from the wife? <laughs> you got to be secure in who you are if you want to overcome an offense. Now, let me give you a second thought. Back, back up to verse 8. It says, you know, Abraham is talking a lot. Respectfully, please. Let there be no strife. And, and he said, we're brethren. And, and I, I'm reading this verse, and I, I'll tell you what I don't see in the verse. I don't see Abraham trying to defend himself. So here's the second thing you need to know if you want to overcome relational issues. Don't defend yourself, which is like the go-to everybody has. Am I wrong? I mean, people love to defend themselves, and you know that's like your first reaction on something. But as, as I look at Abraham here, he didn't defend himself. Moses did not defend himself with Miriam and his brother Aaron accusing him. I mean, David, King David, he's the one who said over and over again in Psalm 7 and Psalm 59 and Psalm 94, the Lord is my defender. God will take care of me. Jesus did not defend himself before Pontius Pilate. He didn't feel the need to have to you know, tell everybody, I'm the son of God. He, he, Jesus stayed cool. He didn't, he didn't try to... You know, expound on it. What, what's amazing to me is as the quick reactions people have to try to defend themselves from things. The thing about God is that he's like the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, which means that he's all-powerful. And so if people have a problem with you, they're dealing with a much greater adversary than you are, adversary than you are. Like God is the ability to just, you know, oversee all things. He, he's in control of everything. Uh, you know, I think it's so funny that our first reaction is to try to defend ourselves. I mean, why do we try to defend ourselves? Why do we feel that we have to defend ourselves right off the bat? You know, I think uh, we do that because we're impatient. And when someone has said something about you and you don't like it, or you feel hurt by it, something inside of you has this immediate reaction to, like, fix the problem. I mean, I know that's what I do. If I've got, you know, something I thought was said about me, I want to go there and make it right. And I get impatient about it. But I've learned that inevitably you're going to reap what you sow. And that your sin will always find you out. Things catch up to you. And so when you just kind of relax and let things play out, you'll find that the truth comes out. I think sometimes we want to defend ourselves because we want to try to vindicate our position. Like you're trying to vindicate it. And you forget what the Bible says when God said, Vengeance is mine, it belongs to me. And if you really want to have vindication, David the psalmist said, you just got to get in the presence of God. Let my vindication come from your presence. You get in the presence of God and let him walk you through it and take care of you and handle things, you'll find the peace of God in your life. The older I've gotten, the more I have really appreciated this principle, that you don't have to try to go defend yourself in situations. You don't got to try to fight with people. And I mean... You know, I've had people who, you know, over the years have come and gone from church. And I remember one time I had a woman and, you know, she was talking to me very graciously and politely about church and it just wasn't working for her. And that was great. We had a, a nice talk. But the longer the talk went on, then the more it became a drip, drip, drip of this isn't right and that isn't right and this needs to get fixed and you're not doing this. And I remember I just felt like I was sinking down in the office chair. And something inside of me wanted to well up and slap the lady with a ruler. But I... Uh, I just decided to humbly, you know, and, and you know, I've just learned God has the ability to defend you in situations. He can take care of you. You don't need to always try to figure out how to, you're going to resolve it. You've got to put it in God's hands. If you want to overcome strife and offense, let God be your shield, your defense, your buckler. That's what he was to Abraham. I'm your shield, he told him. Now, you know, if you're not going to uh, defend yourself and you have a sense of security in yourself, you know what we could call this? Meekness. Here's the third thing you ought to do if you want to overcome relational turmoil. Ask God to give you meekness. Meekness is one of the most misunderstood concepts. What it really means is strength that is under control, or, or even better, controlled strength. Abraham is a very rich man. He's got 318 trained servants in his household. And he could have gone and let the impulsive, hot-headed nephew of his had it. But he stayed in self-control. I mean, this says Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. 
Moses stayed in meekness in accusation. Jesus said, I'm meek and lowly of heart, and, and, and you can have rest for your souls. I mean, meekness is, is an incredible virtue that you need to have in your life. And the thing I've discovered about God is that he does not delight in your own sense of natural strength. There's a very curious, very curious verse in Psalm 147 in verse 10. I was reading it. It says that God does not take pleasure in the legs of a man. And I thought, that's a peculiar statement. You know, God, how, what does it mean, God does not take pleasure in the legs of a man? You know, your leg muscle is the strongest muscle that you have. And it, it's the epitome of your strength. And what God is simply trying to say is he doesn't need it to be done in your strength. He just needs you to be weak so that he can be strong. And if you can understand what it means to submit to him and, and cooperate with him, that's where he can put his super on your natural. He doesn't need your natural strength and your natural ability. He also doesn't take delight in your pride. You know what's funny? When people feel, uh, they get offended when they feel that their, their pride has been hit. When, when there's something about their identity that is challenged, it's like their response is to unleash strength. That's what pride is. Pride is that sense in you that wells up that I am going to go after this and fix the problem. I mean, there's, there's great strength in people, and meekness is the ability to suppress it a little bit. You know, I don't know if you've been watching the news, but in Michigan, there's a dam that has burst, and they've got nine feet of water in some places. is flooding. And that dam is a great illustration of meekness, and, and it's holding back tremendous power. It's so funny to me that when people blow up or, or there's a crack in the dam emotionally or when they let loose on something, it's like all that emotional energy comes out. And there's no meekness to hold it back. There's no restraint upon it. But if you want to overcome a strife and offense, you got to have meekness in your life. See, God doesn't need your natural strength. He doesn't delight in your pride. But what he does delight in is wisdom. You know how James called it this way, James 3. He said, he called it the meekness of wisdom. There's tremendous wisdom in knowing how to restrain yourself and knowing how to harness your energy and harvest your emotions. And if you can ever figure that out, you can get through relational problems quite easily. You know, because sometimes when you get in a fight, it's like you want to win. You know, you feel like you got to get in there and get in someone's face and you want to be proven right. It's like a little race you're in to see who can, you know, prove each other right or wrong. I think one time years ago, I was uh, riding horses with my sister and uh, we were uh, racing. And um, I remember I had a particular horse that had what I thought was an extra gait. And so I remember I held the horse back a little bit. She was a little ahead of me, and as we were nearing the finish line, I just let the horse go. And that extra gait stepped up, and I got through the finish line. I won the race. But I was holding him back. And that's what meanness is. It's the ability to hold back for the right time, the right moment, the right situations in your life. And if you can learn what it is to use restraint in situations, even though you might feel like blowing a top and losing it on somebody, that is how you can make relationships work. You know how many times I've had people that have said some of the dumbest things, and I've had to sit there and listen <laughs> and nod and talk with them. I mean, there's been moments where I just want to <laughs> slap people with rulers. <laughs> All right, uh, go keep a finger here. We'll come back to Genesis here in a minute. Let's go over to Psalm 38. I found a very Curious verse, Psalm 38, and this is in the life of David. You know, David was a guy who had all kinds of strife, turmoil, and offenses around him. And, you know, he said that his loved ones and his friends were far from him. I mean, he's going through all kinds of problems. And it tells us in the 13th verse, this is David's prayer. This is a very curious verse. Watch this. David said, this is what he prayed. I, I want to be like a deaf man who doesn't hear, like a mute who doesn't open his mouth, he said, thus I'm like a man who does not hear and a man in whose mouth is no response. Now, here's what I could say. You ought to all, if you want to overcome an offense, ask God to make you deaf and mute. Deaf and mute. Not deaf and dumb. That's a devil that Jesus cast out of people. De <laughs> deaf and mute. You know, you know what deaf and mute means? It means to be quiet. You know, uh, my wife, when we get in conversations... If she wants to be tactful and discreet in telling me to be quiet, she speaks to me in French. 
She says, Famela Bush, which is French for shut up, you moron. <laughs> so if you ever see her talking to me in French, I just advise you just move on down. Because <laughs> I've heard that French many times. As soon as I hear French, I, I'm like, all right, we just keep quiet. Think about Jesus, man. Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. He was like a lamb led to the slaughter, but he opened not his mouth. He kept quiet in the middle of things. Now, being quiet, this sounds like an effective strategy, doesn't it? It sounds like a good strategy. But it's harder to do than we, I mean, easy said, hard to do, right? Be quiet in situations. You know, the first thing you're going to have to do, your strategy, if you want to be deaf and mute, is first of all, just to listen before you say anything. Just, just, just be quiet. Just listen. The book of James says we should be quick to hear and slow to speak. Quick to hear, slow to speak. Just, just listen. Uh, I found that I have this propensity to cut people off. I know you probably have a hard time believing that. <laughs> but if I feel like somebody is just kind of, you know, talking, and I'm like, t -t -t today, Junior, get to the point. I oftentimes feel the need to just jump in there rather than just listening and letting it follow through, but that would be a way to create strife. So sometimes your best plan, if you're dealing with this, is just, just listen to the person. Yeah. Sometimes the strategy means that you do not have to be overly sensitive to people. Remember, we live in this society where everybody's mad at each other and no one's got thick skin, everyone's upset. <laughs> sometimes you can read into things too far. You know, I remember when I was uh, about 18, I was working at a lumberyard place, and I told the lumberyard crew that I wanted to be a minister. Yeah. And then they all made fun of me for the next two summers, people yelling at me and screaming at me. and It kind of got to me a little bit. And I remember I was out working with this guy, and I told him, oh, I don't think this guy likes me because of this, and I don't think this guy. And I'll never forget, his name was Kai, and he was chewing tobacco, and he looked at me, and he spit. And my nickname was Junior, and he said, Junior, you need to stop reading what people say. <laughs> That stuck with me for all my days, man. <laughs> Sometimes you overthink things, read through things too much, and there's moments in life when you just need to move on, and that's what being deaf and mute is about. Being deaf and mute, the you know, strategy would mean it would mean that you have a little bit of self-control. That's a fruit of maturity. You know what the Bible says mature people in James 3 have the ability to control their tongue. Now, if... if the Bible also says that the more you're talking, the more you're sinning. I guess the answer is to just stay quiet, right? When people say something, sometimes you don't need to add to it. Sometimes the words that you have actually just add fuel to the fire. And so in moments like that, the thing you got to do is just, just, just stay cool. Don't respond in anger. And I, I'm just trying to help people, you know, overcome offenses and problems. Anyone learning anything? Is anyone guilty of anything? All right, let's, let's go back to the book of Genesis, Genesis 18 this time. And I want to highlight uh, one, one more thing here. You know, in Genesis 18, you know, we're going to pick up the story. Abraham's dealing with his uh, nephew, Lot. And, you know, Lot separated himself. Lot went to Sodom and Gomorrah, which was a wicked town. Like, Lot basically moved to Las Vegas. And one day, Abraham's enjoying the day, drinking lemonade on the veranda, overlooking the South 40, and three visitors came to him with a message. They said, first of all, Sarah's going to have a baby in a year, and then, by the way, we've decided to blow up Hoover Dam and destroy Las Vegas. That's about what they said. We're going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> and Abraham starts adding it up. He starts thinking. He's like, well, you know, my nephew Lot, the impulsive, knuckle-headed nephew of mine, is down there in Las Vegas, and uh, I don't want him to be killed. And so he starts thinking about it, and he he begins to pray, and you know the story here. He's interceding on behalf of, of, of the town, and he started out with 50, and it became like an auctioneer moment. He's, God was saying, do I hear 45? Do I hear 30? And Abraham works him all the way down to 10 people. Pick it up in verse 32, 18 and verse 32, chapter 18, verse 32. He said, uh, let not my Lord be angry. He said, I'm, he's real respectful with God. He said, uh, once more, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak. Suppose there should be 10 there. And God said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10 people. Do you know why he stopped at 10? It was because Josephus, the Jewish historian, says at that time, that was the amount of people he knew were in Lot's home. See, Lot was married. They had two daughters. Their, their daughters, his daughters were married, and they had children. 
And so he's praying for his family. I see two things in this that are significant. First of all, it's your family that tends to cause the strife and offenses. <laughs> and secondly, don't ever give up praying for your children. I mean, this story tells us you got to pray for your family. So he's praying, God, for the sake of my family. And the Lord had heard his prayer, apparently, because it says that the Lord went his way when he was finished speaking with Abraham. I mean, God had heard his prayer. And here's what it tells me about offenses and strife. The fifth thing I can tell you is you've got to pray for your offenders. Pray for them. Abraham did not let the bitterness and the impulsiveness of Lot's youth hinder him from still loving them. You know how you can tell when you've got bitterness in your heart is when you can't pray for people anymore. When you can't pray for them, that's when you know that bitterness is right there. Something stirring in you. I mean, think of the example that we have from Scripture with Jesus. I mean, he prayed for people on the cross. He prayed, Father, forgive them. I think about Stephen as he's in the stoning pit, and he's praying that God would forgive the people that are stoning him. Jesus is the one who said, love your enemies. I mean, pray for the people who spitefully use you, and, and that's what makes Christianity Christianity is because there's moments in life when you're going to have to pray for people that have offended and hurt you. You know, the love that God has is greater than the hatred you might have for an enemy. God's love is greater than hatred. And you can always tell when the love of God is in your heart because it motivates you and propels you to pray for people. It motivates and propels you to to want to bless somebody, even if they've wounded or hurt you. You, you. you can tell if God's love is alive right there because your heart will leap on behalf of someone who might be hurt. You know, when he said, I'm praying for these 10 people, he's praying for his family. And that means that, you know, like, he probably was calling out for their names. I, I want to challenge you. Think about someone who's offended you. Pray for them by name, man. When you call out their name, you got to be intentional about it. Like, you're going to have to think about it, the individuals that they are. You want to put some effort into doing something like that. It maybe is an emotional thing, but I have found great moments of freedom come when I pray for people who I think have hurt me or offended me. Because, you know, when you, when you pray for people, it just like God comes alive in your heart. And, and then you could take it up a notch, and you could even pray that God would bless them and increase them. I mean, I know people I've thought about and I've hurt by or situations, and instead of getting angry and bitter about it, I pray for them. I pray God gives them the best year they ever had. God blesses the things they're doing, increases them. It's incredible what that will do inside the heart of a person. Pray for adversaries. Pray for people that frustrate you. And I was, I was, I was putting this message together, and I couldn't help but think about people that I felt like have, you know, hurt me or wounded me or, you know, offenses I've had. And I was thinking back 20 years ago to a friend of mine I was interning with. And it was like, man, we just could not get on the same page. It was like we were just hitting heads back and forth. And, and, and there was an offense that sprung up. But, you know, I've been praying for him over the years. And, and it's like he comes to my heart, and I think about him, and I, I pray for him. And if I ever saw him, I think I'd feel like Ebenezer Scrooge did when he was back in his, you know, little dream right there in high school when he saw his schoolmates. And, and he saw this one, that one. He had love for him, and, and, and he remembered what life was like. And, and it's amazing how the love of God can, can put something in you for people to pray for them, to bless them, to want to see that good things happen to them. Because, you know, you, you, you sit here, unsure, have been hurt by people. Maybe it was a, a, a teacher you had or a, a boss. I mean, how many people get offended at their bosses? <laughs> Could have been an old coach. Could have been a friend you had, family members. Everybody is going to have to walk down that road somewhere. But at moments in life when you're offended, when, when, when there's stress, when there's strife taking place, this is where you're going to have to learn, first of all, how to rest in be secure in who God has made you to be. You've got to know how to rest in Him. Don't let bitterness flood your heart. I can tell when I get bitter with people it just means I haven't spent enough time with God. If you spend time with God, people get less aggravating. Did you know that? So when I find myself feeling agitated, insecure, I just spend time with God. Yeah, maybe, you know, you think about someone who's offended you, and I just want to challenge you to not defend yourself. Keep the mouth shut. 
Don't, don't try to get caught up in strife. Don't try to get caught up in, in, in trying to defend yourself. Control the, the strength that you have. Harness it. Bring it in. You know, you, you know what that's like. Anyone ever been there? When you felt like you could explode, but there's a moment when you could restrain it. And, and that's what I want to challenge you to do. Or maybe today, you got to think about praying for people. There's, I'm sure somebody, when I talk about that, I sense somebody feels like pricked in their heart. Like you don't want to pray for someone. But if, if you will spend time praying for somebody, that, that's, that's when things get real. That's when things come alive inside your heart. You know, this is what happened with Job. In the book of Job, he had these buddies. Remember, they came to him and they were telling him, you know, just, just what a worthless guy he was and how he destroyed everything and it just didn't, you know, he was doing an awful job. And you know, in Job 42 and verse 8, God said to him, I want these guys to come with you and I want you to pray for them. And when Job prayed for his friends that offended him, criticized him, that's when God restored all of his losses. See, there's something about praying for people that keeps the heart alive and keeps it going. So how many of you this morning, when you think about maybe Memorial Day and family members you got to hang out with, or you think about people in your life that have offended you, how many of you feel like this is a time, this is a year, this is an hour for you to grow and get through things? Or you know, maybe with the whole frustration of what's going on in the world, you, you might be offended at people. There might be strife rising up within you. There might be some offenses that are taking place in your own heart. And if that's you this morning, I just want to pray for the peace of God, the love of God, the security of God to come into your life. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I just thank you for a group of people filled with the love of God. Lord, I thank you for people who are growing strong and walking in grace and patience. I thank you for self-control in the lives of these, your people. And Lord, I don't know what's going on in people's hearts and minds, but I just, I feel, God, like you're working all things out for good. You're working all things out according to your will and your purposes. Father, I pray the love of God over us this morning. Mm. Lord, I'm just grateful for a church with so little strife, so little drama. And I pray, Lord, that you continue to grow us in the things of God, that we would be able to treat each other with kindness and love. God, I thank you for health in this body. I thank you for the wisdom of meekness to arise in the lives of people. God, I thank you for people who love you and walk with you. I pray, God, that we as a church, that, that we as individuals would grow stronger and more in love with you every day. Every day. That we walk in love with, with our neighbors and friends. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Mm. Amen and amen. You know, I, I, was, uh, I was thinking about a story I heard of a couple that had fallen in love. This man met a woman, they fell in love with what people do, told her he loved her so much. She accepted his hand in marriage. You know how it is when people get married. They went and got themselves a house and uh, started decking it out, man. They furnished it. They had the bedroom set. They bought a freezer. They got a deep freeze. They had the living room set all set. I mean, they were enjoying their life. And you know what happened one night? Is some robbers broke into their home. And they began to go through stuff, and they came in the bedroom, and, and the husband's right there. He kind of fought his way out, and, and he was tr fleeing, and he was trying to figure out where he could hide. And he remembered he had a deep freeze that hadn't been set up yet, and he hid in the deep freeze. And all the while, his wife was back in the bedroom, and she was screaming for his help. They were beating her up. They have her black eye. She's screaming, honey, help me. Take care of me. Well, when the robbers left and the coast was clear, she's calling for him, and he came up out of the deep freeze. And she was so hurt. I mean, she said, you left me here to get beat up by these guys. You don't even love me. I mean, she got offended by that. Can I get a witness? You know, you could be full of strife and bitterness and resentment about that. And he said, I, I do love you. I, I care about you deeply. I, I, I just, I, I don't love you that much. Because, you know, he was saying, if, if, if they had a caught me, I thought for sure they were going to kill me. They were going to kill me. I'm just trying to save my life. And I didn't think they'd kill you, and I, but I'm sure they'd kill me. That woman went to church just a little while later. And in the message, she heard that verse we had up here, Memorial Day, that Greater love is none than this, that he would, one would lay his life down for his friends. And it struck the lady. My husband loves me to the best of his ability, but he doesn't love me the way God loves me. See, only God will love you enough that he's laid his life down and everything for you. 
And maybe this morning, the love of God is not that real to you. Maybe it's something you've never experienced, never received. And I just want to give you a chance this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you don't know the Lord, if you've never experienced his love in that dynamic of a way, if you've been caught up with the offenses of people, I want to give you a chance this morning to receive Jesus and who he is and his love. The fact that he is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. He'll be with you through everything. If that's you, put a hand up. I'll pray with you. Amen. Amen. All right, will you stand up with me this morning? I mean, it's good to be in the house of God. It's good for us to be here. You know, I, uh, I have been praying quite a bit lately, praying like on overtime and more than I have in, in, in many years, really. I felt the Lord's put it in my heart. And there's a verse God keeps speaking to me over and over again, that his ears are open to our cries. And I, I don't know about you, man. I've prayed about so many things. I've seen God answer me on so many levels. And I have great confidence that if you're living godly and praying in the will of God, that God will answer your prayers. He hears your cries. And so this morning, as we pray, if you need prayer, I want to invite you forward. I want to invite our ministry team. And I want you to know that God hears your prayers. He, the, the answers I have gotten to prayer have been little things and big things. But, man, if God's people will seek his face and pray, God will hear from heaven and answer you. And I want to just challenge you. If you need prayer for anything, we're here for you. We want to invite you down for prayer. I want to thank you all for coming out today to Bethany Church. I want you to know that we bless, value, and love each one of you. And uh, I want to challenge you to invite someone and, and invite them out to church in these next weeks ahead, man. It's, it's supposed to be 93 next weekend, so enjoy it while you can, if you like rain. Anyway, we love you very much. Great to have you out this morning. We will see you all next week. God bless.